Right, now we're looking at the transpiration stream. So first of all, movement of water across the route. So here we've got a, a nice setup. We've got the xylem here. I'm going to do it in blue. I'll write sideways as well. Xylem. That's our xylem. Then we've got an endodermis cell. This is our endodermis. And within that, we see these red lines, which are our Casparian strip. Okay, so the Casparian strip is basically a block. It blocks movement of substances, but it most importantly blocks the apoplast pathway. So I'll put CS for Casparian strip. I'm not going to write that all out. Um, we need water to get in the xylem. How are we going to do that then? So it starts here. If we look here, this is a root hair cell um, zoomed in slightly, and we can see within it we've got these membranes. Okay, so to get water in, we have to transport these mineral ions into the root hair cell, and that is done by active transport, which uses ATP. Okay, so water enters the root hair cells via osmosis and mineral ions via active transport. So now we've got within this cell, root hair cell, we've got a low water potential. Low water potential in there. Okay, because we've just transported these assimilates into the cell. Let's go to that circle, so it's not too messy. So now we've got a low water potential in the cell, it's lower than outside the cell, which now has a high water potential relative. Okay, So water moves in via osmosis into the root hair cell. Okay, So let's draw that here, we've got water's moved in to the cell. Water then moves towards the low, even lower water potential down here, so it moves via the apoplast pathway, which is around, so maybe I should demonstrate that, around apoplast, it doesn't actually go within the cytoplasm, and then it gets here, okay, and with it, it takes the assimilates via mass flow, so the assimilates move with it via mass flow, okay, in the apoplast pathway. They reach the Casparian strip, which we've said blocks the apoplast pathway. Um, so what do we need to do? A similar concept here, where we've loaded the root hair cell with assimilates, we now need to load the xylem with the assimilates. So once again, we load assimilates. This is an active process. It uses ATP. Okay, um, and once again, water, we've now set up a water potential gradient. So there is a, a low water potential here now. Okay, so water moves via the simplast pathway into the xylem. Okay, so now we've got water in the xylem. It's brilliant. Water will not, it will not move back across the um, Casparian strip because the pathways have been blocked, okay? And it's also got a greater desire to move up the xylem, which we're about to speak about, rather than back, back into the roots, okay? Now, let's look at mass flow. So mass flow is caused by three things. A high root pressure, which is caused by active loading of mineral ions in the medulla, um, 
which makes water be drawn into the medulla by osmosis. High pressure in the root medulla builds up, forcing water carrying mineral ions into the xylem, which we just spoke about there. That is what we spoke about. So this, this loading into the xylem, I'll do that in a different colour, just to make it stand out more. What's happening here? This loading causes a high root pressure. Okay. The second thing is a, the transpiration pull. So we spoke about transpiration and the water molecules are attracted to each other by force of cohesion, which we know about in unit two. So cohesive forces hold the molecules together in a long chain or column. So that's right, water column. Because this is really essential here. We spoke it about in the importance of the perforated, not the perforated walls, sorry, the um, in the xylem. Let's go back to the slide on the xylem. The bordered pits, okay, which we showed you here. They're important to support the columns, water columns, okay. Um, so we've got transpiration pool. So these water columns cause water to move up the xylem. Okay. The transpiration pool is we lose water from the leaves and those water molecules being lost pull the column upwards. So if we look if we zoom in loads here. And I'll draw a xylem here. And I'm going to draw water as dots. They're all attached to each other. They all pull each other. Then if we lose one water molecule there, it's going to want to it will pull all the rest of these molecules up one, okay? So then as they've got cohesive attraction to each other. Okay, that's the transpiration pull. So that's one method of mass flow. And then with the final one is capillary action, which is about adhesive forces. Forces. So these columns of water aren't necessarily straight like that. They're more like this. So water is attracted to the side of the xylem vessels, just like that. So water is attracted to each other, they pull each other up, but then they also attract to the side. Xylem walls are very close together, it's a really narrow diameter there, which helps these water columns fall. That is another reason why we have mass flow. Okay. Let's look at plant adaptions. So first of all, xerophytes. They've got a thick, waxy cuticle. So xerophytes are plants that have to adapt to lack of water, they live in hot conditions like this cactus I've drawn here. Thick wax cuticle, they've got stomata in their low epidermis and sunken in pits, so they are surrounded by humid, humid air, so water does not move out. They have lots of water storage, so they've got fleshy water storage in the stems. They've got widespread roots, so these roots go really deep into the soil. They've got a long tap root which can um, help get really deep in the soil and get access to any water available. They want to maximise the amount of water. They also have a, they can use photosynthesis in the stems. So they've got green stems, unlike most plants. So these xerophytes can photosynthesise in the stem. They've got Closed stomata and a low water potential in the leaf. This is caused by salts being stored in the leaf, so salts. Saline solutions, okay? So by having a saline solution in the leaf, the water does not want to move out. In fact, it wants more water to be in the plant, okay? And we've got spines to reduce the surface area of the leaves. So cacti have spines. Two xerophytes here to look at is cacti and marum grass. Then we've got hydrophytes, so these are plants that live in water. They've got air spaces which allow them to float and 
the airspace is also allow O2 to diffuse quickly throughout the plant. Um, they've got stomata on their upper epidermis this time, because if those on the lower epidermis, the water the water would not be able to escape. The thing is, they're surrounded by water, so as we know, they've got a surrounding high water potential. Let's put an arrow there to say it's a high water potential. Surrounding the, they're surrounded by water, so the water in the plant does not want to leave. So how do we transpire? So we have these things called hydrothodes in in hydrophytes. They release water like in spurts. They shoot it out from the surface of the leaf, and they allow the transpiration stream, which we spoke about earlier, um, to occur. So they can transpire. Final thing to look at is transpiration, translocation, and mass flow. So this is in the phloem. Um, it's the movement of a simulate through the plant from the source, which loads a simulate to the phloem, to the sink. Okay, source to the sink. Um, so we need to get sucrose from the source, which would be areas like the leaves, to the sink, which would be areas that need to use this, so like the flower. Okay, so the source creates the assimilates, photosynthesis, etc. Other, and but then these areas of the plants need to actually use our assimilates. So how do we load the phloem? So this vessel here is a phloem vessel. We've got our companion cell on the cell on the outside, and we've got our um, sieve tube elements here with the perforated walls. Okay, so they've got holes in. Right, so first of all, we've got high concentration of hydrogen ions within the companion cell. And as we've got this high concentration of H plus ions, hydrogen ions, in our companion cells, they obviously do not want let's do this in red, they don't want to move outside the cell. Because we've got an even higher concentration outside, okay? So how are we going to do this? It's going to be by active transport again. So we use ATP, we've got these channels here and our hydrogen ions move out by active transport. A concentration gradient is created outside the cell. Okay. We've now we accumulate so many H plus ions that they want to move back in. They want to go back into the cell. But the only way they can get back into the cell is through these co-transporter um, protein channels. Okay, co-transport channels. Co means with, so they can get back into the cell if they carry with them a sucrose molecule which are these things here so to get into the cell a hydrogen we'll do hydrogen and plus a sucrose which we did in yellow can travel through into the companion cell. Alright, so via co-transport we get sucrose into the cell. 
This is classified as facilitated diffusion, even though sucrose is moving against its concentration gradient, because there's a really high concentration of sucrose in the cell. Um, however, the process does not use ATP. We still classify it as facilitated diffusion. The sucrose concentration is really high in the cell, so naturally it's going to diffuse into the sieve tube elements via diffusion. Okay, so then we get our sucrose, it forms sap, which we spoke about earlier, sap. And then we've managed to actively load assimilates into our flow. Okay. Now, how do they move down the flow? So this is by mass flow. So movement is caused by the differences in hydrostatic pressure at either end of the tube. So at this end of the tube, the phloem tube, when I say tube, we've got sucrose moving in. And of course, water is going to follow it. As we've said earlier, water moves to lower water potentials. A buildup of water and sucrose creates a pressure gradient. Okay, So water and sucrose are building up here dot some water molecules in, I'll do some yellow dots of sucrose, so we've got a high pressure here, lots of molecules building up at the source, which has loaded in the assimilates. Ooh. The source loads it in. Then so water and sucrose are here. They've formed a high pressure here. High, I'll put KPA, which is the measurement for pressure. This pressure is much higher than at the bottom, which has a low pressure. And we also have a low water potential here. sorry, a high water potential. As water is accumulating at the bottom. Um, so the sap moves down the pressure gradient. The pressure outbalances the water gradient, okay? So the difference in pressure causes them to move down. This can just be ignored now because the pressure is causing this mass flow movement. Key word. Sucrose movement increases the water potential of the sap. So water follows sucrose down the water potential gradient. Movement of water and sucrose maintains the pressure gradient. So as long as they keep moving down, more the source can keep loading and then the sucrose and the water can move out. Which keeps a maintained gradient. Let's do this in a really bright red. I've got lots of drawings here, it's really messy. This is a high pressure gradient. The so sap moves by mass flow. And that is all we have in transporting plants. That is the whole of Unit 3.3.